travel down and we'll get them out for a little bit of late supper after the program ends tonight. Um, it's been an honor for me to know Dr. Perkins over uh, the last three decades. She's a uh, person born in Louisville, Kentucky, and yet uh, a New Englander in every sense of the term, uh, the bulk of her lifetime. She attended uh, prestigious schools in the Wellesley area, then in Annapolis and Maryland, and then came back to Harvard University to complete her doctorate uh, in the early 1970s. And right after completing her doctorate, uh, she was retained on the faculty of Boston College, where she's been an esteemed uh, faculty member now for almost four decades. Can you imagine teaching uh, collegiates and post-collegiates, uh, directing dissertation students, uh, uh, others and the like, uh, for almost uh, four decades now? Uh, as you know from the title, she's coming tonight as, as she is as a scholar of the sacred scriptures, the text. Sometimes as Catholics, we're very attuned to the changes in our church over the decades from the Second Vatican Council, especially around liturgical changes. Most of us, if we're kind of humble and honest about it, aren't aware of the incredible contributions made by Catholic scholars like Fame uh, to the broader area of scripture scholarship uh, throughout the world. And tonight we have a teacher among teachers in that regard, a prominent Catholic biblical scholar. And so she's going to share with us about the teacher's uh, stories, the parables, how, as so many of us are sensitive ourselves, uh, how they happen to be the, some of the greatest stories of, of life-changing events in people's spiritual journey of conversion the world's ever known. So we welcome today a, a prominent uh, researcher uh, and author. Uh, she has served in leadership positions, especially the presidency of the Catholic uh, Biblical Association, and uh, I know you'll delight to enjoy her remarks, and please uh, be willing to come up and ans ask any number of questions uh, during the Q&A. Would you give her a nice, warm uh, Cape Cod welcome? Mm -hmm. The clergy better listen up because, uh, you know, everybody's going to be primed for this Sunday's Gospel, uh, which will be bringing up the parable of the Good Samaritan. So, uh, there is one, one friend of mine in my parish, I, I have a certain Bible group, and I just send out notes, including to the pastor. And uh, so, sure enough, I sat next to her at church on, on Sunday, and she had her sheaf of notes. <laughs> uh, so, uh, the... Uh, uh, getting ready to sort of get into this. But this is, we're sort of halfway through the year of Luke, and so part of the idea of fishing around, as uh, Monsignor Hoy and I were emailing about it, a topic, was to come up with something that would latch on to what we've been hearing and also will be hearing as we finish out the year of Luke. So that was really how the, the topic came to be chosen. But I also titled it Luke's Parables and Today's Church because the parables are already, as we get them in Luke's Gospel, a process of an evangelist taking the tradition that he's inherited about Jesus, rethinking that tradition and presenting it for people in his church at the end of the first century. And Luke is the only author who has the kind of Greek, Roman, literary education that he gives us a little preface to the gospel. And in the preface, he tells us what he thinks that he's accomplishing in the way in which he's telling the story of Jesus. So as a good uh, author would have done in those days, he addresses his preface to a patron, a man by the name of Theophilus. We don't know anything more about Theophilus uh, except what Luke tells us. And he it says that he's trying to do a better job than the previously available accounts or narratives. So there already were narratives around. We happen to possess one of them, the Gospel of Mark, that Luke used and reworked. But he thought that he needed something else for his community, for this uh, more educated patron that he's addressing. He also says about those narratives that were floating around that he's using in his gospel that they had a prior stage. 
a stage of eyewitnesses who gave oral reports, who didn't write things down at all. So there are actually three stages to gospel composition, and this is a very important thing for Catholics to understand because this is actually part of the instruction of the Pontifical Biblical Commission on the composition of sacred scripture. Uh, in our understanding of sacred scripture, we have stages. It grows. It develops. It starts out with people who are the immediate witnesses. But they aren't running around with video people recording things and writing things down or anything like that. So a fundamentalist approach to scripture, which tries to see everything as though it were a literal videotaping of the exact words of people and so forth, is contrary to the Catholic understanding of scripture. We, we see this oral tradition. The second thing about the oral tradition that we recognize is that it was written down in bits and pieces in a culture where only 10% of the people are literate and where everything is hand copied. Uh, you can't just you know, send somebody off to the Xerox machine and say, hey, make more copies of the notes. Doesn't work that way. So there's an intermediate stage for many works, both in the Hebrew Bible and in the Christian scriptures, of traditions that were written down, but then were reworked by what we might call the inspired authors in, to give us the gospels that we have and the other works of scripture that we have. Uh, so that there's a three-stage process of composition in giving us what we know as scripture. And therefore, we can see, uh, in the case of Luke, we can compare him sometimes with Mark and see how he actually goes about reshaping a story. So we know by his own words that he is retelling the story for a fairly educated audience that would expect this kind of preface and for a generation that needs something else that he doesn't think is provided by what they have. Why does the church need it? Well, Luke gives us a few clues. He thinks sometimes it needs a better way of telling the story. So he says he did, and this is part of his interest in writing history in the sort of ancient sense of writing history. You, you investigate the bits and pieces and parts of the tradition, but then you have to figure out in what order you're going to tell it. So Luke clues us in, and, and this is where I go absolutely bananas, of course, with the Sunday reading and the lectionary kind of base things that we do in the parish, uh, because it's almost impossible for people to get a sense of the order which Luke has so carefully created to tell us things, because we're always jumping around, you know. We, take a huge leap, or they leave off part, or they leave off the good part, or the middle part, or some other part. Uh, and Luke felt that there was an order to it, so it's very important at least sometimes to start at the beginning and read to the end. You know, he meant for you to do that. Uh, the second thing is that he says that he wants to make it clear, he wants to make it to give a clear certainty. So he uses the word, Greek word asphalia, which we associate with asphalt, which at least to most of the Massachusetts roads uh, would not give you the greatest sense of certainty. You know, you just see road construction and panic. Uh, but the word asphalia is an interesting word because in Greek it sometimes means, and for an educated audience like Luke's, it means something that, that would survive a legal challenge. 